Prior to the First World War, Glasgow was the quintessential citizen soldier. He volunteered as a teenager to join the Wide Bay Regiment of the Queensland Mounted Infantry, and he balanced his time between being a grazier and conducting military training on the weekends. I never really realised how much the Empire meant to him, and he was passionate about that. And put that into context that he was 21 when he was part of a contingent that went over to Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee and he rode in the procession. And to come from Gympie to London in the middle of all that pomp and ceremony would have been very impressive. He volunteered for active service with the Queensland contingent for the South African War. He fought numerous battles in South Africa in 1900 and 1901, was mentioned in dispatches and received the Distinguished Service Order. When he returned to Queensland, he continued his citizen soldiering. He supervised the raising of the 13th Light Horse Regiment at Gympie. He was promoted to captain in 1906 and to major in 1912. So he had wide experience in those years before World War I. In South Africa, he had experienced battle conditions. He had heard the crack thump of rifle fire. He had smelt cordite in shell fire. He'd seen the reality of battle casualties, the confusion of attack and defense in battle. He'd established a network with other commanders that he would serve with during the First World War. But most importantly, he'd witnessed the service of other Australian soldiers. He'd shared living conditions with them and he understood their values of courage, teamwork, initiative and respect. My mother idolised him, absolutely idolised him. And I suppose what my memory of him would be via her, because in reading the letters that he wrote back to her as a child, a lot of what she instilled in us later was what he was trying to encourage with her. In one of the letters it mentions that he was sending the Rudyard Kipling's If back to her. And we subsequently all got, my brother, sister and I, framed copies of If to hang on the wall. So she obviously thought that was important for us too. During the First World War, he was one of the first Queenslanders to volunteer on the 19th of August. He was appointed as the Deputy Commander of the Second Light Horse Regiment. And from the start, he was seen as a great trainer of soldiers who held them to military standards, drawn on his own experience of the war in South Africa. Then at Gallipoli, he led and shared the conditions with the soldiers. In command at Pope's Hill, he led a charge of 200 soldiers at Dead Man's Ridge. He was wounded in action, mentioned in dispatches, and he had a real affinity for his soldiers during those first Gallipoli battles. As a result of his service at Gallipoli, he was promoted to command a 13th Infantry Brigade and saw subsequent service in many battles at Polygon Wood, at Mokay Farm on the Western Front, and the decisive battle at Villers Bretna. There at Villers Bretna, when his brigade was surrounded on three sides by the Germans and he received a request from the German commander to surrender, he simply answered, tell them to go to hell. He could read the battlefield and he was incredibly loyal to his own soldiers because he had served closely with them through Gallipoli and the Western Front, and that resulted in his quick promotion through the ranks of the Anzac forces. He was very unassuming and um, was very apprehensive when he went to Buckingham Palace to receive, um, I've forgotten which decoration that he got at Buckingham Palace, but he wrote that he, to his girls, that he hadn't made any mistakes and he would have far preferred to have been at the front than going to Buckingham Palace. 
His true characteristics as a leader were his decisiveness, his capacity to read the battle conditions, and to be prepared to challenge orders from superior commanders. And secondly, his wonderful loyalty to his Australian soldiers. And the best example of that was again at Villas Bretner, where he was ordered to conduct an attack to recapture the village of Villas Bretner and move across the front of the enemy. He challenged the order and recommended that a different time of attack and a different angle of attack be chosen in order to set the best conditions for the Australian soldiers to achieve success. If the Anzac forces amongst them, General Glasgow, had not halted the German advance, then the course of the war would certainly have changed. Because of his performance at Villers Bretna, in the closing stages of the First World War, he was promoted to command the 1st Division. And there, during the Hindenburg offences, under the command of General Monash, he played a key role in planning each stage of the offensive. When he was called as part of the Battle of Amiens to lead his division in battle, he planned so significantly and meticulously that his division achieved all their objectives on the first day, captured 2,000 prisoners, a number of artillery pieces and other vital pieces of equipment that the Germans could no longer use in their offensives. So here was another demonstration of his maturity, his decisive leadership and his ability to lead Australian troops in battle. The other ones that I thought were interesting were what John Monash wrote and this was pertaining to when he was a soldier, that Glasgow always got where he wanted to get, was consistently loyal to the Australian ideal, and intensely proud of the Australian soldier. After the war, Glasgow continued that wonderful example of service. He chose to represent our nation and state politically by being elected to the Senate in 1919, serving as our Minister for Home Affairs and Defence in the 1920s, being selected by our Prime Minister to be the first person to go to Canada as our political representative. And indeed, whilst in Canada, uh, being chosen by our Prime Minister to chair and assist the Quebec conferences on two occasions with the Presidents of the United States and Canada. So, that service to nation, that service to the public continued. And his service to the military continued through his citizen soldiering. He was appointed the commander of the 4th Division and set that example in training the post-World War I Army. Undoubtedly, he set the conditions for a military society that was actually well prepared for World War II. And being in official war history, C. E. W. Bean. He says, with keen eyes looking under puckered, humorous brows, as shaggy as a deer hound's, with the bushman's difficulty of verbal expression, but a sure sense of character and situation, fiery temper, but cool understanding and firm control of men. He could, by a frown, a shrewd shake of the head, or a twinkle in the eyes, awaken in others more energy than could have evoked from any amount of exhortation. I think General Glasgow today is viewed in terms of being the most successful and distinguished soldier that Queensland produced. We see his image in Post Office Square in the wonderful statue created by Daphne Mayo. We see many prominent officers in buildings around Brisbane named after him. We see that his public service is referred to as the man that stood by Queenslanders and stood by his nation during battle and after the war. So his image is still one of a person that gave his life and service to Queensland.